Okay, welcome everyone. Um, I'm loud, aren't I? Anyway, uh, welcome to the long breakout session for today. Um, it is, this room is huge, so everybody who really would like to not just read their, their emails, etc., come down so that we can actually have a lively interaction because this is not about us showing data, this is about you know, us engaging with everyone in a discussion on how can we actually build this atlas. Um, so the state where we are um, is that, you know, we've had uh, a, a number of labs generating data sets that will contribute to the first draft of, of, of what a lung cell atlas could be like. But it's like traveling by subway, right? You'll be at a few locations in the lung where you'll see a number of cells and you have some idea about what's happening there. And you'll be, there's other locations where you know something, but everything in between is basically a dark zone. So that's just nothing that we know there. So going from these few cell states and types that we now describe to a real map of a lung is quite a challenge. And we actually invite everybody to contribute to, to, um, to the discussion on how we can actually take on this challenge. So this will be a two hour discussion, which is challenging, right? At least I think that's challenging. Um, and I'm not going to be entertaining you the two, full two hours. So I want you to, you know, to enter in a discussion with us and, and with each other and so that we can actually come up with a number of ideas. Uh, I'm Martijn Nawijn. I'm the, top, the bottom one of this, this list here. Uh, the other moderators today are Jay from, uh, actually from here, from Harvard Medical School, Naftali from Yale, and Dana from Sloan Kettering. Uh, they're sitting, you know, in this corner here. Um, and we'll be showing you some data that is mainly meant to actually provoke some discussion and to, to, to raise questions and then get your input and start a discussion that with you know, all of you here. Um, am I missing out anything? Oh yeah, and then uh, Jay and Naftali will do the reporting back to the large, large uh, uh, to, to, you know, to the plenary meeting at the end of the day. So with that, I think we should get started. Uh, uh, please be you know, actively discussing with us, otherwise I'll just be listening to myself and I do that too much already anyway. So for those who are lung agnostic, which is fine, you know, just, just, just help us uh, think about these things. This is what a lung looks like when you talk about where are you within a lung. So this is more or less an accepted way of, of uh, uh, dividing up the lung in smaller pieces. And when, whenever you look at data from Jay, for instance, he'll actually say, you know, I got my cells from, from there and there and that lobe and that lobe and that, et cetera. I mean, that's how it works, right? This is an established uh, 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 coordinate framework, if you wish. The resolution is not great, but, you know, we have this airway, wall, airway structure that actually might help us uh, find places in the lung and define places in the lung and always sample from the same site. So for instance, where we do our studies in healthy and asthma, where we take bronchial wall biopsies, we always take the same bronchial uh, uh, piece of bronchus where we take these biopsies, so that we're always at the same location. So it's the third to fifth oh, generation, oh, I hate it when this happens, um, which is, you know, you start just counting one, two, three, four, maybe five, and that's where we take the biopsies. Because asthma is a small airways disease, so you want to be a little, little bit deeper down into the airways. Um, this is just a picture to show you what the lung looks like on an ultrastructure. Um, now, Naftali will tell you, and you know, I'm, I'm breaking the news here a little bit, that you know, there's actually something very unique about lung, which is that it's always moving. So these cells will be always in this moving environment. So a location is always relative to something else, right? To these landmarks. And that's what we need to bear in mind. But we need to develop within the human cell atlas, I think, the lung cell atlas, you know, a, a standardized way of referring to where are you sampling in the lung. But we'll have that discussion later on. Because it, it actually gets difficult when you sample here. Because, you know, when the airways are still large, and you can still count it and follow it, it's easy. But when you get a piece of resection material, you know, where was this exactly taken and what airway are we actually looking at and what piece of, 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 of respiratory uh, uh, alveolus are we looking at, etc. That's going to be difficult. So that's up for discussion. Um, 
Which so is, as I know, said, this is the data uh, or a reflection two, of the data three, from J and four, four, maybe five. Oh. And, that's where um, and you know, you can see here because that they actually used the system to, see, to so say where they, where they took the sample. Down but as I said, it's a lope, right? It's still um, quite a, a This is just a picture to show you what the lope looks like. You actually want to know exactly where. Because I can't imagine that Jay, correct me if I'm wrong, that you actually process the entire piece of that lope. It's going to be a part of that, right? And which part is going to be? So that's things that we don't, you know, how are we going to annotate that? in the metadata to be actually, so you know, a as a useful data set for something else, right? I mean, it's going to be great, and that's great data set. I'm not saying it's not useful, but, but we need to, um, you know, to actually annotate it to a cell atlas, the lung cell atlas, um, you know, a, a standardized way of referring actually, to where know, are I'm you sampling your lung. Data set. Well, but anyway, um, let's not go there. It actually gets difficult when um, you So this is this is our data set. We send the as I said, you can still count it and follow it. We send for the upper airways as well, and then we also have some data from parenchyma. Um, what airway are we and for us, at and what piece you know, we of, sample of, a lot of individuals and uh, run them all through uh, the, uh, the, the 10x in our case, that's going to be uh, and then try to. Um, so that's uh, up for discussion. To, to, to monitor um, so individual as I individual said, this is the data. Uh, you know, you see cell types of, of, or clusters of, that are driven by um, one individual. You know, you can see here what do we that do? they actually use this If we have a cell cluster they, driven by one individual, any but ideas? As I said, what, it's what would a load, right? It's still quite a, 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 a large If I want to publish this in a nice journal. You actually want to know exactly where, because I can't imagine, but Jay, correct me if I'm wrong, you kill it, actually right? process the entire you kill the cluster. It's a one load. donor it's cluster. It's going to be an right? artifact of some sort. And which sort. part is it going to be? So that's, that, that's so, the yeah. you, you, you just take it out of the data set. This, this is that in this the must be, this must be wrong. You know, There's only one this, individual useful data set in the, I don't know, 20 I mean, something be example, example, that has data this cluster. This must be something weird. And actually, that might be a completely wrong way to go around this. You might actually want to include all these cells and just sample much more individuals. And maybe, you know, it's a cluster that only exists in one out of 20 persons. That's so this fine. is this is our data set. Right. We sample, could, as I said, real biology. On, on, on specific how do we know this? So we how many upper airways people do we actually well, need to sample to get to know data from parent kind. are these rare clusters? Um, are they real? Are they and real for us, artifacts? You know, we sample a lot of individuals. So and something else more through the the 10x in our case. You have to follow. Uh, and be a then try to come on, guys. To, to, to okay, great. Individual to individual variation, and you know, you see cell types or clusters that are driven by one individual. And what do we do if we have a cell cluster driven by one individual? Any ideas? What, what would you do with that? If I want to publish this in a, mm -hmm. in a nice journal. Yeah, you kill it, right? You kill the cluster. It's a one donor cluster. It's going to be an artifact of some sort. So yeah, you, you you just take it out of the data set. This is this must be this must be wrong. There's only one individual in the I don't know twenty some that we sample that has this cluster. This must be something weird. And actually, that might be a completely you know wrong way to go around this. You might actually want to include all of these cells and just sample much more uh, individuals. And maybe you know it'll it's a cluster that only exists in one out of twenty persons. That's fine. Right? That could that could be real biology. But how do we know this? So how many people do we actually need to sample to get to know are these rare clusters, are they real, or are they real ad artifacts? So something else to discuss. You have a tough audience. You can be a little bit more responsive. Come on, guys. <laughs> okay, great. Yeah. And we're going to see some rare things and some common thing, and uh, we have to actually think about how we sample in terms of space and depth to try and get the rare things, and trying to distinguish between this is a rare thing and therefore we found it here, or this is a rare, th but in every lung versus this is a rare thing in some people. Exactly. Yeah, that's great, Dana. So I, I, I fully agree. I mean, how well do we know the heterogeneity within the airway wall? Yeah. Um, Naftali, you go first, and then. So, uh, <laughs> yes, yes, I'm ready. So for the purpose of being controversial and also exposing my age, I was still in the age when I joined the lab. If you found a band of a gene, it existed. 
right? Well, you didn't need to show it at multiple people. If it wasn't multiple people, it was their problem, right? right? And I think in some ways that's what we're seeing here is we will identify very rare events that are actually extremely meaningful. But that's going to be one of the challenges in the discussion, how do we form an approach to it, right? Absolutely. But, but I think, Martine, what you're talking about is if you have a common cell population that actually is forming a distinct cluster in a single individual, right? And there, that gets to the fact that, that actually what we're calling normal is actually difficult to define. And right. Actually, we're not dealing with especially if we're dealing with uh, some sort of donor lung tissue, mm -hmm. we're oftentimes dealing with something that's not really healthy, um, although we're calling it healthy. Um, and so we may be seeing signatures of diseases like pneumonia or different, different uh, um, other Absolutely. diseases that are there in that quote unquote normal donor. Yeah. And I think that, that can only be statistically addressed um, by large numbers of samples. I, exactly. I don't know of another way to do it. Exactly, no, I fully agree. At the same time, if you have this like common cell type but that's in a different class. It means that it's, it could be a different state of the cell type, which could still be reflecting real biology that's just, you know, rarely sampled or maybe in repair because, you know, two weeks before something happened to the lung of this person. I mean, in our case, we sample by, by uh, bronchoscopy really healthy people, at least as far as we can tell, really healthy people. So we, I hope we don't have too much disease in there. Um, so that's, but we do, I think disease is relevant. That's why I brought this slide, which is our asthma data set. So it's sampled from the same location in age, gender, uh, whatever matched asthma patients. Um, and then you all, all of a sudden see that you get, you know, you, that if you start clustering, that the clustering is different. Uh, you, you start to identify slightly different cell types, even if you collate the data into one data set. And you, you get frequencies of cells. I mean, this is just a count table uh, put, put, in, you know, put into a graph where you say, okay, there's so many cells in that cluster in disease versus healthy. And then there's states here, well, call it is a bit boring. Let's say this specific basal activated, this activated basal cell state, that's strongly increased in asthma. But that doesn't mean that this does cluster separately if we have it in the healthy but it's still probably a cell state that's present in healthy as well, or just in lower numbers. And now that we have more numbers, you actually pull it out of the data and it, because you, you add the, 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 the asthma data there, right? So actually, you know, you could also sample enough uh, uh, healthy individuals, you will also find this cell state there. So this again goes to the numbers, but you know, adding disease into the data set, you just add more variation into your data set, which is gonna be relevant to also define what's, you know, what's the healthy state versus what's a truly diseased cell state. And I actually need to, I, you know, I would like to get some input from more computational people, like if I have a data set like this, how do I define a truly diseased cell state? Should that be something that's absolutely absent in healthy, or you know, how do we think about healthy versus diseased in these sort of cell states. So right now in, in, in the computational field, um, you know, clustering is very useful and clustering is very powerful because it gives a small number of groups. It's easier to compare across things, but actually we're going away from, from clustering and actually describing a landscape, which clusters could be one instance of it. So we in the computational world like to sort of basically say this is the phenotypic space. It has a geometry in high dimensional space. We like to represent it as a graph because the graph allows us to do many different things. And yes, we can cluster it down to, to little states and, and, and look at, um, at, at things. There's metrics when clusters are separated or not, even though we're finding more and more that there is a continuum of states. Therefore, a lot of the analysis has moved towards something called archetypes or boundaries. What is the edge? Often you see that, yes, you have the cluster in healthy and you have the cluster in disease and they cluster together, but the boundaries in disease are farther. So if you look at a single cluster and you think of like a circle, you know, the healthy individuals only go up to here and then the disease individuals within the same cluster would go up to here. So we actually want to look at states and we want to look at it as a cloud of potential states the cells can be in. And then there is, depending on the biological question, um, statistical stats one can build. And I think right now, and I hope that part of today or the next two days, 
will merge communities is that the computational communities are only looking at statistical things. Because we're dumb, we don't know anything about the lung and we don't know much biology. So we can do statistical properties and cluster and find archetypes and find trajectories. And some of these things matter and some of these don't. In the biological communities, they have their markers and their favorite genes and their favorite classifications. And if the data breaks these classifications, they throw it out. And um, that's what, you, didn't you just say that? Absolutely, And yeah, I think yeah. that the way to build an atlas is to say, not every gene matters the same, not every question matters the same, not every deviation from a boundary matters the same. You have to understand the system, the question, the biology of the system to understand what matters. But we are connect, collecting an unprecedented amount of new data. There are data-driven statistical techniques to open our eyes to new things. Therefore, we have to communicate more and work together. And, and that's part of building a community, which I hope to build today. Great. Herbert. So uh, some of these boundaries can be broken by technicalities, right? And uh, I guess the main challenge is to distinguish um, you know, like some batch effect, what we what we call batch effect, from real biology, and uh, yeah, I'm wondering what's the what's your idea on that. So, if if we see a shift in of the cluster, we need to look at the genes that actually produce the shift. Mm -hmm. And yeah, my feeling is also um, defined uh, perturbations in animal models uh, help us understanding what could be you know the. The, uh, the heterogeneity in human patients when we when we start sampling large cohorts, and so I'm I'm wondering can we use this information in uh, better defining the the real you know phenotypic landscape as you called it. So this goes back to the question of experimental design, and yes, there are batches. So first of all, yes, you need enough numbers, you need methods to, you know correct batches, and there's different ways where you can actually evaluate uh, when a batch is a batch and when a batch isn't a batch. Uh, for example, uh, in some of our cancer data, we have very, very big differences, but actually we see the healthy immune cells align. So by saying, by, by actually evaluating what the batch shift is by using statistics, you could say, these are effects that are general batch shift. They have nothing to do with the biology of this cluster and this boundary. And uh, these are actually shifts that, that, that are more general and not just at this spot in the phenotypic space. So one, there's methods to sort of distinguish what sort of batch effects are general. And there are now methods that are being developed in the computational community to try and, and, and globally normalize things. We can't fix everything, by the way. The other thing is <laughs> experimental design. If you actually work harder to have standard SOPs at the beginning, rather than everyone does their own thing, and standard methods to collect the data to reduce the batch, then we have more power. Mm -hmm. So you have to design a good experiment. You have to have good statistical methods to analyze it. And you have to have biological input to what matters. And, and those three components are sort of the three key ingredients for a successful atlas. Yeah, thanks. Some, sometimes the small clusters uh, can align, while bigger clusters deviate from individuals. Um, so then you would say for some of the clusters, there's no batch effect. Uh, you know what I mean? Like if you have that UMAP and some of the small clusters are perfectly aligned between two individuals, okay, one, while a bigger cluster. You need to look at these things uh, in high dimension and not in UMAP. Uh, so all the visualizations <laughs> okay, yeah. are misleading. So if you keep yourself at, and I don't care which visualization you're using, <laughs> shifts do not ever over-interpret over visualizations. When you want to do your statistics, go back to the high dimensional space. And in the high dimensional space, you could collect statistics to look at what batch effects are global and what lot batch effect, or what effects are very specific and therefore are unlikely to be batch. Mm -hmm. Can I steal your? But that could be something one, one could discuss here, right? You say you from cancer cells, you, you take out normal cells in order to correct your batches. Um, wouldn't it be an idea to have a standardized spike in of particular cells that you would run with each 10x um, and you would have whatever certain amount of 100 cells that would at least help you to standardize that? 
Um, I mean, we do standard cursors every qPCR, right? So it's not <laughs> necessarily a very new concept, but we should maybe try to adopt that maybe more in order to be able to characterize across patients within labs and across labs um, this I issue, I, right? I like the idea, but uh, you know, the, the multidimensional space that Dana is referring to might be uh, far away from these reference cells that you then use, and then I'm not sure how well this is gonna... If you try that, mm -hmm. it works miserably. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, and, and, but that's interesting, why, I mean, it can fail, of course, because you, I mean, it's like with ERCCs, they fail because they're not enough. We don't use these cells to normalize. I just gave that as an example to show that, that it's not, that, that it could be different. We actually use all statistics to normalize. There's, there are different normalization methods. So we do, the current normalization methods, none of the successful ones, says let's use these few cells. One of the things we see is actually the batch effects influence every single cell type in a very, very, very different manner. And it's actually a horrible thing to use one cell type to normalize another. Yep. Are we? Oh, sorry. I just thought I'd be so loud. Sorry. It's a, it's a very attractive idea to do that. The problem is there's no gold standard. Like to take a cell, to store it, to freeze it, to expand it, and to even know that it's a uniform population. I mean, you, Dana can speak to the fact that the faster you get these things into in sequenced, that's probably the most important parameter we've identified so yeah. far. So there's no way to hold a standard. Um, I mean, that's of course different, but the, question, the main question is, is it better with a standard than without it, maybe? But, I mean, it's clear that it doesn't solve everything, but not having it, is that really better? I mean, that's, a, that's an open empirical question, I guess, right? I mean, and, but that's why we're here, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So again, I like standards, and standards help, and standards have helped a lot of projects. But so far, the things we have tried in this field of stand, as standards, and the things that at first thought seem like a great idea, and quite a few of us actually thought that that idea was a great idea, failed miserably for so many reasons. Um, that, you know, no one has yet thought of a standard that actually serves what we'd hope a standard would do. Yeah. To wrap up on this team, are we planning to include uh, monozygotic twins? Do you think it would be of value? And also, are we planning to perform repetitive sampling? I know that particular your group has this ability to recruit subjects huh. repetitively. But they um, like maybe having the monozygotic twins will give us a little bit of reproducibility in, in terms of going back to Dana's high dimensional spaces. Yep, Naftali. So I actually, again, oh, have yeah, my yeah, own have mic, to mic. But um, so here's the thing. Um, you need to speak into the mic. Yeah, I, I'm speaking into a mic. I have a built-in one. No. <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, so here's the thing. Um, again, ex ex exposing my age. So I remember these discussions with the first AFI microarray of 588 genes or whatever it was. And what we actually learned, as an empiricist, I deeply believe, is that actually the most important thing is not necessarily to try to enforce standards, but report all the sources of error. So when you provide a sample, you should know where it's coming from, what you did with it, and try to standardize as good as possible. But the main, most important thing is actually document, because then you can deal with it. But the other thing is, I think that this is not the answer. This is one of the parameters we put in to describe cells, right? So in the end, it's going to be this whatever, what we call this complex triangulation of the cell that will give us a close approximation of what is a cell, right? Um, and, and then we're dependent actually on the next phase of the technology, right? So I'm, I'm actually going to speak about it a little bit. In my view, yep. I think I, I said it several times today, is there's no way, you know, don't kid yourself. We cannot tell if the cat is there or not without killing it. Right, so that's what we do. When we get cells out of an organ, 
this is not hematology that you, the cells really like to be in, uh, in, uh, in a fluid uh, solution. These cells are sitting in extracellular matrix. That's their livelihood. The moment you get them out, they change already. Yep. So only by looking at them from multiple technological approaches and, and yeah, yep. exactly, and, and spatial and others, and actually multiple sources will be able to triangulate actually what's a normal cell. Yep. Okay, great. So uh, one moment, Pascal. Um, yeah. So to get back to your question, uh, Sasha, um, I'm afraid that, you know, if I'm going to sample these individuals, like at the same location, again, there'll be scar tissue, etc. So you can't, and then it's going to be a different location, right? So it's, that's going to be, there's tec technicalities there as well. I mean, we've thought about it, but so far we haven't explored this further. Okay, Pascal. Yeah, I wanted to go back to, to the, uh, the idea of the internal control. And this is perhaps a, a very naive statement, but uh, in a way, when I'm looking at your experiment, the experiment by uh, Raj, uh, the own experiment that we are doing, uh, we are already finding some very consistent population of cells. And so I, I was wondering if it was not possible to, to take that information and, and to, to, to use that as a way to uh, uh, increase the quality of the data set just by comparing with, yep. with a series of experiments that have been done already. And well, in a way, uh, I, I think that this approach uh, would be uh, uh, good for the community mm -hmm. because it will give to the community an ID for the big uh, group of cells. And after that, probably the information about a smaller uh, population uh, would become stronger. Yeah, yeah. I think we'll get back to that later. I think, but it's it's an interesting point. So uh, because I, I don't want to spend the whole time. Oh, yeah, there's yeah. The there's a question from the live stream uh, sure. actually yeah, related ahead. to this slide. Sorry, it goes back a ways because there's a slight lag on the live stream. But um, the question is, when comparing cell numbers between disease and normal lungs, how does one control for variation and dissociation? Because the mechanical properties might be different between disease and um, normal tissue. Yeah, that's actually a very good point. So um, if I'm correct, uh, do I have the table in here? It's not responding, there we go. Um, no, I'm, I only have the healthies. We do have more cells in asthma. So yeah, oh yeah, so uh, yes, this is a very good point. It might be very relevant and Naftali will come back to it later. Okay, <laughs> great. Yeah, we're already half an hour down, so I'm going to close up. So the last thing I wanted to discuss with you is the use of ex vivo culture models to actually map this space in, with more uh, uh, resolution, if you wish, that the multidimensional space. So you might have noticed that this, this plot here is only epithelial cells, right? So that's because I just like epithelial cells. Uh, and we culture them either in ALI, which is air liquid interface culture, so that's where epithelial cells build a barrier, which is what Pascal also does. Um, and when we do that and we compare it to the clusters that we get from the, uh, uh, from the in vivo data, and this is a very crappy way of analysis because this is just me sitting behind an Excel sheet, uh, so there's much more advanced way to do this, but the clusters don't really overlap. So there's either specific subsets of cells or states of cells that are present in that ALI, um, or I just need to find a better method, but that's something that I think might help us understand and chart this this multidimensional space in which these epithelial cells, at least, in the lung might live. And then once you know the, the, you know, the playing field, if you wish, then you can also see where are they in health and where are they in disease and where are they when they live up in the lung or down in the lung or you know, when you're old or, 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 or young, etc. So that's one thing. Um, the other uh, model that we use, which is also used in, in, in other organ systems, is this organoid model, although I'd rather call it a spheroid model. Um, where you culture these epithelial cells, and there all the differentiation stages and all kinds of intermediates are very well represented. And here, the clusters actually look much more like what we find in vivo. So I think this is actually a much better model if you're really interested in the differentiation of the uh, airway epithelial cells in vivo. Again, you know, this is, a, this is just a very basic analysis. We should do this properly, but, uh, you know, we need to get the data set to a good computational biologist, I think, and then they can play with it. Um, anyway, so I'd like just 
to spend the last two minutes of my part, and then we'll move on to, 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 do, to the next moderator, uh, on what do you think about use, the use of these in vitro or ex vivo models of primary cells? Will it help us chart a lung cell atlas to, you know, to be useful? Anyone? <laughs> I'm not gonna give the floor to you. Yeah, Pascal. Well, I, I just wanted to, to say a word about the use that is made uh, of these uh, primary cells mm -hmm. or spheroids. Um, for instance, in cystic fibrosis, you, you can, uh, the, uh, the FDA has approved some drugs based on uh, the evidence uh, shown by this type of, of culture. So I, 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 uh, I follow uh, the results that you are showing. There might be difference. But at the same time, I think that our field is fed by a lot of information coming from uh, this type of culture. And that would be a mistake to <laughs> decide not to right. use it at all, especially when we are uh, trying to uh, understand what's, what is the mechanisms, the molecular mechanisms of a drug, for instance. OK, Scott, you also want to say something? Or? No, I think that I think the, the organoid models, both in the airway and actually there's some now that are actually in the distal lung as well, mm -hmm. can be very, very useful in terms of thinking about differentiating, differentiating cell populations. I think if we're looking at all at immune cells, we can't do that, right? Because it's right. very clear that the, the, the microenvironment is driving that. And there's probably, there's probably some education of the epithelium and endothelium by matrix and other components that we remove from these organoid systems. So I think there has to be some caution with it. But they're right. very useful for understanding but biology. I agree with you. I, I fully time. agree. But if you look at this, this, and that's why I actually brought this slide with uh, the asthma epithelial cells, you, what, what we're actually looking at is that the differentiation of these epithelial cells in asthma is different from that in, in a healthy. So if you, if you first map in, in, in organoids all you know, the possible differentiation stages and then map your disease versus healthy onto that framework, if you wish, that actually I think might be very useful. But maybe that's just me. Right, last, last question, then we'll move to the next moderator. I mean, uh, are organites meant to be a part of this human cell atlas? I mean, if you have not really figured out, I mean, that's of course, I mean, of course one should work on organoids, but is this right. task of the HCA, or is this actually the HCA being the solid foundation to then validate organoids and, and find it out? My gut feeling is that rather the latter is the case, and then maybe related, so, I mean, if you brought up the spatial things, I mean, are there concerted efforts across individuals within individuals to map out the spatial issue? Because after all, practically, it will be important if you, sa if you somehow maybe sampled uh, one centimeter above or, yep. or yep. take a wrong turn, as I understand, right? Then, yep. then you want to know the size of the variation you would expect, right? Exactly. And, yep. and having that systematically mapped out wouldn't that be something that would be really relevant because I, that you can only do in this context, right? Right. Because as I understand you, it's open whether in at the right or the left. I mean, how much variation would expect whether there are spatial gradients across the whole lung, which probably also exist. Um, and I think wouldn't that be very important for a lung atlas, much more Absolutely. than trying to move to organoids and, and, and do the third step after the second somehow? Yeah, no, I fully agree. At the same time, these models might help you actually do that analysis. But Jay, I think it would be good if you now give your presentation, yeah, right? Maybe I'll try to ask some Socratic questions that'll go right to what you're saying. I do think it's really important, like what belongs in an atlas and how much of it is experimental and how much is, is purely descriptive. I don't think there's going to be an absolute right answer. Um, you know. So I'm going to turn on the. Ah, perfect. Okay. Um, so I entitled it "The State of the Atlas," and I think what we'll do is compare the work that uh, two groups, uh, me and Aviv, and also uh, Aaron and Alan Klein, uh, did to try to say what we were able to do in the mouse, what we were still worried about in the mouse. And what, how can we extrapolate some of that to the human? Because I think even the mouse atlas, which was so much easier, is far, far, far from complete. Um, and so this is what we found in the murine atlas. And of course, everyone's attention was drawn to the ionocyte because it was this brand new cell. 
Uh, but I think there was a lot of other stuff in these papers that are actually more relevant to thinking about uh, lung disease as a whole. So we were able to pull out the common cell types that we thought existed. But even there, I'll point out something. We were only able to pr pull out like maybe 30% of ciliated cells. It's one of the three most common cell types in the lung. And we made conclusions about ciliated cells. Uh, so what if the other ciliated cells are just entirely different, and that's why they die, versus some stochastic sensitivity? So I ask you, like, what's the answer? Yep. Bulk RNA-seq is the answer, isn't it? Sorry? I mean, if you want to know whether you missed out on major cell types, then you should take the tissue, make good old bulk RNA-seq, and see whether you can actually reconstitute that to a right. reasonable level. So we did that, and in this case, we were reassured because it was such a huge population yeah. so that we knew it would be represented. But if it was one of these rare cells, we'd, our degree of confidence would be much, much less. I mean, and even there, if you would, I mean, I think if you would just do enough replicates um, with deep enough sequencing, I mean, it's just a matter of how, how much. How, how deep you go. Dana? So we were actually finding a lot of cell types that uh, differ, you know, you say the technical term and the non-technical -te term at the covariate rather than at the variate le univariate level. So in the bulk RNA-seq, or if you just take uh, medi uh, medians, they look the same. But when you look at the combinations that appear in them, they look different. I think the only way to overcome the biases that we're now seeing in, in single cell RNA-seq, and this is something I want us to really focus on in this discussion, is to realize that the spatial methods, even though that's not the data that we have been seeing recently, are really becoming more and more ubiquitous. And if we're talking about planning the future spatial matrix me methods, where a lot of this um, fixed tissue, where a lot of these issues are, are less of a problem, is where we're going to begin to see markers and marker combinations that we haven't seen our, in our uh, disassociated data, and that will be the flag. So I think the way to really identify what we're missing is to do a sufficient amount of in situ things with the right markers, and choosing those markers is going to be the key. Yeah, so Dana, that's exactly what I was going to say. So we did that to the best of our ability. But it was a few markers, and we couldn't discriminate the ciliated cell types. So how does one define what the minimal signature should be? Do we just go to the limits of, let's say, a multiplex in situ hybridization or codex and say, look, 50 is good now, and we'll just try it with 50? Or is there some statistical way to know like, where you should be aiming? So, Jay, wouldn't it be nice to uh, combine, I mean, I, I, I fully agree with the spatial, but you could also uh, combine maybe uh, epigenetic single cell or nuclear seq methods with your single cell RNA seq methods to, to find, you know, to find those ciliated cells you're missing and see whether they're different at, the, at those levels. That will already give you, give you first exactly. indication, right? Exactly. So we, we're doing exactly that. We're doing nuke seq now for these cells. And I will just point out for the general audience that aren't lung biologists, there's this thing called a type 1 cell. The cells in the lung are very, very unique. So if, you know, the nucleus is probably this big and the extent of the cytoplasm is thin and probably goes to the walls of this lecture hall. So when you, if you don't do nuke seq, you're probably missing the vast abundance of the cytoplasm in that cell. So I think in this organ, particularly, nuke seq does have a, an, an important role. Yeah. Naftali, were you going to say something? I was just going to say to the non-biologists, and actually to the biologists and also the people who do pulmonary, that lung exists for the type 1 epithelial cells because gas exchange happens through it. All the rest is tubes and machines and this, but if the type 1 epithelial cell is gone, the, you need gills. So I think it's exactly, and we don't see it because actually, although it covers a huge space, it's actually very rare. Or not rare, but it's not common. And it's also extremely sensitive to both culturing and uh, every manipulation. So here's a, a, another question. I mean, I could probably just stay on this slide, but I, I really would like to ask you, like, let's say once you get a rare cell, neuroendocrine cells. If you look at neuroendocrine cells in the gut or the pancreas, there's a diversity of neuroendocrine cells that are all producing different hormones. 
We know in the setting of small cell lung cancer that those cancers can produce different hormones. But how deep should we go when we sequence these cells? Are plate-based sequencing methods still useful once you get a rare cell? Do you just do 10x? Where do you end? Uh, because we actually expected to see heterogeneity in this population. We couldn't find it. So I'll take it back to you. I mean, the thing is, that the, the, I, and this is another thing which, again, I'd love your answer and everyone else's. There's so much to investigate. It, it is open-ended and it's never ending. So I think one of the key things to define is, in my opinion, to, to keep you know, the, the, the motivation going, the atlas should be built you know, with a, a long-term plan to get everything and which could be evaluated as we learn more because we learn more as we do things with you know clear priority questions so we should define okay if we were to build a lung atlas what's the best thing it could teach us how could it impact lung disease understanding of development the most critical questions that that you guys care about it let's prioritize questions once we have the the questions, what we hope to get out of the atlas, what would be wonderful if we could learn from the atlas, then we could design the first wave of experiments to make sure that these questions are addressed. We'll get a lot of data that can answer a lot of other questions. We'll discover a lot of unexpected things. A lot of extra bonuses will come our way, which will allow us to plan the next stage. And I think defining what those questions are, what do we want to get out of it, defines what should we collect. And without that, you know, what is our goal? What is the question? What would give us benefit? You can't sort of say, well, what should we collect? Other than everything, give us a billion dollars. <laughs> we, that's what we are saying, but, okay. Okay. Yeah. but when you say we can't say that, Scott, would you like to answer the question? Yeah, I, I just would turn it around a little bit to the computational people and ask your question as statistically. So how confident can you be um, with the sequencing technology that you use that there isn't heterogeneity within that cell population? We that's can't. Really, I mean, that, that's my question. But like, is there, but how is deep there, do we have to go? But I'm asking uh, Dana and others, is there, is there a statistical way to tell us what's the chance that we missed it? Um, you know, if we, if we have some reference set like the gut, right, um, uh, to go to is, is, you know, can we look at and can we do that on different platforms so we can design the experiments, right, to detect it? Um, I'm not a computational biologist, as you know, but uh, you know, in the gut, most of these were actually, these neuroendocrine sites were initially identified in organoids and then validated to also exist in the real gut. So, you know, this, this, actually, it's a nice system. So. Uh, but I, th I think that's actually important, and I, I guess what, you, what this question really is, right, if you have this little yellow blob there and you're asked, is there as much variation as I've seen in other tissues, I think then you should estimate the amount of variation you see here, and then you can have power simulations to tell you this amount of heterogeneity or cell types I would have seen with 80% certainty. So it's actually a question of power analysis that should be linked to those, to those things, right? And, and w then you can also add, well, if I would have sequenced more, would that actually help? Or would, I think power analysis in this respect is probably underestimated, especially because we have good distributions from other tissues where one could say, okay, I see neuroendocrine variation in heterogeneity. I can model how big that should be. And then I could ask, well, actually, I don't see it, right? So you can turn a negative result into a certain result because you can say with 90% certainty, I would have seen that heterogeneity that is existing in other tissues. And I think that's really important point that maybe should be used more. Huh? Yeah, I think one of the pro big problems with, with power analysis uh, right now is that it, there's a huge confounding factor. So if you say, here's the data that we have, here's the number of cells we have, here's the variability we see in these cells relative to the variability in other cells, relative to the depth, depth we, we measured, we can say, for this experiment, for the number of cells uh, that we measured, for the amount of variability, uh, you know, it's this likely or that likely. And we can, for this specific scenario, define p-values for specific things. However, I think much of the variability that we're missing is because what happens if you, you know, go to another location in the lung deeper, less deep in the airway? What happens if you go to another individual who lives in an area with greater air pollution yeah. or is a little bit early, uh, later or is uh, overcoming a cold? So I think uh, 
there's also variability about where you sample. And you can define statistics for this data, but this data captures a small window of the biology of the lung. Yeah. I would say, you know, in the lung compared to the brain, I mean, we know so little that a low resolution atlas is gonna teach us so much. And in response as a biologist to your, your computational question, like how deep and with what cell we should go, I mean, we don't really know all these cells are worth going deep on. So there'll be a first answer, which is if disease suggests that something's interesting. For example, the goblet cell is almost certainly interesting in IPF and asthma then you may have particular individuals who are interested in going really deep in that cell. But I think the first thing should be 1.0, and we'll learn an enormous amount from 1.0, kind of intense depth in a few patients and breadth in, in uh, many. But maybe perfect is the enemy of the good as we go through. I wouldn't want intips, like, give me at least you know three patients with intips yeah. depth, but uh, then, you, then you can go breadth on right. specific regions and questions. Okay, this is great. Um, I will just skip this. Well, there, we have more than what you want already, Dana. So, we'll, so check. OK. Um, I wouldn't call that intense step, but OK. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I did want to mention this, which I think may allay some concerns, at least for me. At the same time that we published our tracheal mouse atlas, Aaron Jaffe and Alan Klein uh, published their atlas, which in many ways was similar, but there were some differences. And the results were remarkably consistent. So I'm the first one to say this is a highly well-defined region in the mouse. And also, mouse are kept in these beautiful conditions that are very different than like Beijing in December. <laughs> There's no question about it. And there will be variability introduced in that way. But I think these two data sets were so remarkably consistent. There was no like hugely dramatic finding that you couldn't see in both data sets. And it may be actually that the difference between those were like where we decided to focus our analytic power. Not in the data set per se, but what we decided to look for and how deep. Um, if that is at all reassuring. Um, but, but on the flip side of this, location really matters. Now, I'll remind you, like, the mouse trachea is that big. The trachea is about that big. Um, and all we looked at in our lab was the proximal trachea versus the distal trachea, because we had reasons to think asthma might work differently in those two. And so we sat, found heterogeneity in a cell type we did not expect to really find cell heterogeneity in. It's the secretory cell. And it varied along the proximal distal axis. And the, we had to search for this, actually. It wasn't clustered. We had to subcluster after we originally found it. But there were some teasers in this data set about inflammatory receptors that we thought might be interesting. And one of them, for example, was the IL-13 receptor, which is IL-13 is known to be involved in asthma. So the IL-13 receptor is higher in distal uh, uh, secretory cells. So we played in proximal airway, uh, and we you know, didn't see many mucus cells. We, we played a distal, and we saw more mucus cells. And we did this over and over again, and it was at least consistent in this one strain of mouse. I want to add that, too. Like, the different strains behave completely differently. So when you have an outbred organism like human, this is going to you know, change the degree of variability that you're going to see. But then you know, there was something more dramatic. We added IL-13. And we couldn't get many of these cells to turn into goblet cells. But this really shocked me. I mean, you could get a preponderance of cells in the distal airway epithelium to turn into goblet cells. Um, and, and again, the point I just wanted to make is this is over a one centimeter distance in just the trachea in the mouse. And we have really no idea how the human maps onto the mouse. In fact, the vast majority of the mouse that's been studied uh, is composed of airway that looks like nothing like the human airway. Um, so oh, that's the reason we work on the trachea, because it's the only part that's reminiscent of most of the human airway. Um, so just to give you some intuition as to how much is unknown, here's a point I'd like to uh, make, and maybe this will relate to the alley. We were able to, you know, Aviv was able to, and her postdoctoral fellows in particular were able to make diffusion maps and graphs, and we were able to make inferences about new progenitors 
um, through computational methods. And it turns out, amazingly, some of those uh, progenitors were located in unique structures. Now when you go back and you look at the trachea, we can't look at a whole map of the trachea and not see these things all over the place. Um, they're just, so we are missing some easy stuff, I think, just because we've trained our eyes to, there's, there's a problem in lung biology and I can just, whenever you see something you don't expect, one of the things you say is, this is an injury response. Um, <laughs> And, uh, and it's, you know, what will happen is in that area, you'll have a proliferation of stem cells and you won't have differentiated cells. So it's a reasonable thing to say. But our criterion for an undifferentiated cell is just that it isn't one of the known differentiated cells. But I think basically that's why we were missing this all this time. But there is a pro, um, oh, and I'll tell you, these are, these are just two markers that map those structures. We don't really know how well they map onto the human. But you can see like different humans have different numbers of these, of these types of patch cells in as much as we can tell. And this indeed may be an injury responsive structure. Humans are thought to maybe have more of them after smoking. These are all still inferences, but there's good reason to think that with different environmental structure, different environmental pressures, human lungs will behave very differently. I mean, this is well known for a long time. And is actually the basis for a lot of, of classical lung disease is some environmental exposure. Uh, and then I, I do want to address this because I'm a developmental biologist. So for me, lineage really matters. I mean, I feel like I just don't understand anything if I don't have lineage. So I didn't actually believe any of the computational lineage data because, you know, I was new to me and I'm used to indelibly labeling cells and then following their progeny. So then we did this experiment where we actually did conventional lineage tracing and then also single cell seeked all those cells over the course of the lineage trace, which was, which was really useful and taught us a whole bunch of new things like about kinetics and it allowed us to make this map in a much more convincing way and I won't go through it but and you know we can generate those diffusion maps on humans and we've started to do that but how are we going to validate these lineage inferences in humans because they will matter for things like you know stem cells converting into differentiated cells or cell of origin for a cancer so I think this is a general question for the human cell atlas, which is how do you verify lineage predictions? So actually, I have an answer to that. So our plan is, you know, yes, in humans, it's pretty hard to verify. Sometimes in some systems, maybe in lungs, there might even be enough mutations in there for you to, to verify, and as we get better at uh, recognizing mutations, at maybe doing targeted DNA seq to, to areas such as microsatellites that mutate. Along with the RNA, we actually might be able to use microsatellites and things like that to get it into human. Um, in the meantime, the actual lineage tracing methods are getting better. And yeah, diffusion maps, vanilla, I wouldn't trust either. <laughs> um, the methods are getting better and better. And we're learning what works and what doesn't work in, in scenarios which can help us. Now, now there are all these CRISPR systems that are coming up. Now, we're not going to be able to use them in human, but we are going to be able to use them to improve our algorithms. And at some point, you know, if, if these algorithms are deeply vetted and much more sophisticated than run a diffusion map, and if we understand on how to see signal of true um, you know, differentiation in data and what true differentiation looks like far above our naive methods here in systems where we can validate, where we can use the CRISPR system. You know, we can compare, we could also use mouth homology and homology in, in organoids where we can stick the CRISPR. But th at the end of the day, I think we can improve the methods in vetted systems far above that so that at least you trust it a lot more and wait for the DNA uh, to also give you some hint. But I think it's going to be ha a concerted effort. But actually, that's a problem I'm not worried about. It's, it's going to be work, but there's a path. Good. Good. So I, and I think we discussed this, uh, Dana. Part of it is actually how many cells we can measure and at what resolution, because there's millions of cells in the lung. So they don't just switch stage. They 
evolve. So in theory, if you will profile a million cells in the lung, you will find all stages. So you would be able to assume some continuity. Yeah. It will require a shift in our way we look at analysis, which now is looking at separating cells. Yeah, and, the, and, and, you know, and think about the continuity of phenotypes. But, but it's also just a matter of numbers right? and, and, and resolution. It's not only a matter of numbers. There's, there's, a, there's what direction do you go? Um, all these methods uh, assume, for example, that things go one way. Right now, the pseudotype methods have a, a, a horrible assumption in them that you know there's no you know history goes forward. We know in regen regeneration and trans differentiation, this is not the case. Current methods aren't very good at you know like a cell that goes vish vish vish. So you know right now it follows very simple trajectories, which is a very strong assumption. Which given the plasticity of the lung, I'm I'm not comfortable making. Um, so even if you have all the cells in the world and you have all the intermediates, you need better methods to know how to walk through that space. Yeah, so, and I would say, kind of tying together some of the uh, conversations we've had, um, and it's about uh, in vitro models for this. From the mouse, we were able to really confirm that a lot of what we were seeing in terms of lineage was reproduced in an air-liquid interface culture. Uh, in this setting, and that gave us useful information. And what that also does is give you time, a real time, not pseudo time as a variable. And that was very useful too in terms of temporally ordering these cells instead of pseudo temporally ordering them. So I do, my bias would be that because there are only lineage predictions that are available from computational biology, but that's something that we're really readily going to have, and it's going to get better and better. My bias in this organ system is because we have a good in vitro culture model that we use those in parallel, even as we're making a descriptive atlas. It's almost like hypothesis testing as we go along, because computational predictions of lineage, are, it's so powerful. But it would be, not, I think that should almost be part of the taxonomy and Not geography. Not only for lineage. So. I, think, you know, I think it's very, very important. An atlas that, the, that, that doesn't have a functional layer is meaningless. So of course we're going to need other systems where we can do things that maybe you know, we aren't allowed to do to humans to really, even, even beyond lineage, functionally annotate yeah. what we're looking at. And that's the mouse and the in vitro systems. And they have to go side and side for every layer of interpretation of this atlas, including lineage relations, which of course is the most interesting thing. <laughs> Any other points that anyone wanted to make here? Um, and then I'll just say, just to point this out, you know, we did the best we could. We clustered. And, you know, that's somewhat arbitrary. Uh, but we were able to find, exa for example, two kinds of tough cells that we didn't know existed. And how, what did we do to convince ourselves that they were different? We just did antibody staining. And in this case, only two markers, because antibody reagents generally, a developmental biologist will tell you, are like most of them are not validated reagents. It's another thing that we should just think about when you're multiplexing. It's nice to do multiplex ISH, because you have relative confidence that you're actually measuring what you think you are. With antibodies in human tissues, very few of them have been subject to the proper controls. So I think that's something to, to really consider. Um, and then, you know, we that don't even... That could be a concerted effort. Sorry? That yeah. could be an effort that, that, could, that we that say is could. an important effort for the... Because it's, it's possible to do. At, at, at MSKCC, at least in the cancer setting, we have an entire center that you know, basically does all the nitty gritty of validating more and more antibodies in FFPE, but yeah. It really might be worth doing. Because what we found is, you know, when we found these ionocytes, we were surprised that they had the abundance of CFTR message in the airway epithelium. And of the many things that were confusing were that you, you we ha I wish I had this picture. We had a beautiful antibody stain for CFTR. Um, and it looked perfect, apical membrane channel, but it turns out that the stain was on the knockout mouse. And, <laughs> and you know, there are some like, you know, there are like 400, there are more. There are hundreds of antibodies for CFTR. So I think if we really want to generate a bona fide atlas, we may need to make sure uh, that we have quality control for any kinds of antibodies or measure things in a different way. Another question and, back at you. Sorry. Between RNA and protein, how much, how, how much do you want to put weight on, on, on putting more focus on the protein? 
versus the RNA? <laughs> I'm more comfortable with the, I'm more comfortable with the uh, the RNA. I'd rather know the protein. If, if that doesn't answer your question. But. And the human protein atlas doesn't. I mean, they did that, right? I mean, across. Yeah, no, no. It's all tissue slices, and I mean, every antibody. Hundred. I mean, does, shouldn't that help? <laughs> Not that I have to do anything with that, but... The labeling has, are not necessarily uh, great at each time. So if you look, for instance, uh, something which is poorly expressed, like CFTR, it's very difficult because it's not very abundantly expressed. Also, mm. this is part of the problem. I'm just I'm going to end there, but if there's any general questions related to anything I've said, is anyone, or is anyone online, or? Yes. Yeah, good, please, keep it coming. Um, so going back to the spatial question, what is kind of the plan for the lung atlas to, to go through the space? I mean, it's, I mean, is there an experimental design to ask how much spatial variation you have for which features? I mean, that's a kind of obvious thing to do, I guess. <laughs> yeah, so what, what Aviv and I have done is like do eight lungs very deep all along the airway generations, the alveolus, the subpleural region, and we were hoping along with other groups, I'm sure there are many other groups doing this kind of thing, that'll give us some kind of broad understanding of the heterogeneity. And then we can take a first look and try to interpret that. We didn't even talk about certain things, for example, where an airway branches that like branch point is a very special anatomic branch point where, for example, the neuroendocrine cells change. We know that already. It's just we didn't capture it in the initial atlases. So there's some landmarks that we have that are largely just based on classical anatomy that we've sampled for. And that should give us at least a first pass. You know? and, and related to that, I mean, is that knowledge of 3D anatomy that you have already implemented in in the data platform in, in terms of, uh, yeah, I mean, all these spatial coordinate frameworks, I mean, it seems to be straightforward to do, but is it there? I mean, is no, that... No, 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 none of it is there, and it's still in the, in the planning. So you're, you're imagining a far more advanced and a far more planned project than it is right now. I'm not quite sure if I imagine that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I mean, uh, just concretely to, to, I mean, make nail some points here, that wouldn't that be things we could kind of nail down? No, I mean, today, <laughs> somehow? I that's don't, the I mean, goal, yeah. The, the goal, the goal of this right? session is actually to nail down where, wh how really to add uh, a lot of the spatial components. So actually, that was one of, the, our, one of our primary charges is to actually answer your question. I'll just quickly introduce myself. I'm a, a wrangler for the DCP. I work on the metadata team. Um, and so um, the practical steps to get into that are to exactly come up with these terms. We've got um, strong ontology links. We can add these things to the ontology. Um, and also be nice with us when you're trying to describe, you know, try and describe your experiments for, you know, not you, but for, you know, um, the other people in the room. Um, so, and also if you've got any ideas that are specific to the lung, the metadata schema that we've got is very modular. So if there, if there are um, solutions that you come up with that are specific for the lung and useful just in the case of the lung, we can definitely work with that and add modules that are specifically there for the lung. So practically, if you have any good ideas about how to describe these things, how to add ontologies, the, way, the ways in which you want to move forward, then the, the step is talking to the metadata team um, and we, we have forums online where we can discuss that. We can start to link people together in this room to have those discussions online in a centralized place, and then we can actually adapt the metadata schema so it, it makes sense for you all. There's a perfect lead-in, actually, to Naftali, who thinks a lot about structure of the lung and coordinate systems and how to define the anatomy and the histology. So I think, you know, you may really give us the answer. <laughs> no, no, I'm not going to give you the answer, but I, I promise I'll confuse you. Um, so thank you again uh, for inviting me and uh, bringing me over here. Uh, I'm sort of representing the lung disease domain and a little bit the, parenchym the lung parenchyma because the lung, while the airway is easily well defined uh, with structures, the lung parenchyma is a little bit more complicated. And, I'll, and then I'll say why actually do we need to think about the context of disease 
in a normal human cell atlas, and why is it important? How does it fit? So I mentioned a few things about structure function and diseases, and then I wanted us to speak about what we need because this definitely feeds into our understanding of the no normal lung, which is uh, compartment, spatial complexity, this, and, and, and other things. So um, actually, I have a, one more comment. Um, I'm actually disappointed that nobody is tweeting about this conference. This should be a cutting edge conference, so we should, we should have our own hashtag and argue offline and get good discussions. Anyway, so what do you need to know about lung disease? One is there's many of them, uh, monogenic and complex. Probably more than 10% of the population is affected at a certain step of their life. And that's what unique to many other diseases because um, most diseases either affect early life or late in life. Lung diseases actually have a U-shaped uh, uh, curve and they're really common when you're young. And then they disappear and they show up again. So actually if I sample a lung of somebody who's 40 and I call it normal, he might have had a disease or he's gonna develop a disease. So the concept that we actually are sampling normal is even in the most healthiest adult is probably, if we, for instance, a good example is swimmers. Swimmers have a high rate of asthma, upper airway infections, and viral infections all the time. So basically, they're inflamed all the time, but we call them normal. Their pulmonary functions are normal. So there's many diseases. The other thing is these diseases are, can be either in one region of the lung or multiple region, and it's a little bit unpredictable. So the lung is, and the other thing you want to remember, the lung is always injured. Except for your skin, it's the only organ that's constantly um, exposed to, to the environment. And the environment changes. And, and we have, there is some data about it, like levels of ozone, other things. You will be asymptomatic. And the reason is that your lung is calibrated to suppress inflammation. Because if there's inflammation, you're going to get sick. So, um, and again, these are not uh, important. The other thing which is important is many of chronic lung disease, even the adult, have early life origins. Um, and the last thing is that unlike most people when they think about disease, they think cancer versus normal. Um, lung diseases are highly heterogeneous. Most of the lung tissues that have disease in them have many normal cells or the other way around. So this is basically, I won't reiterate, this is the, sort of the complexity. So the lung is actually built for one thing, which is to do gas exchange. So you have the tubes, the airways that lead to it, you have the alveoli, and you have this very complex network of capillaries and endothelial cells. So there's many known resident cell types in the lung. There's an argument if this is 30 or 40. The other thing is the lung changes its cellular um, content very quickly. So for instance, when we sample the lung, we may change actually the cellular content of the lung. Um, it is a perpetually mobile organ. You don't think about it, but you're breathing. Your lung gets, gets smaller and bigger. The lung has different factors that affect for it. For instance, um, the pressures in the lung, the perfusion pressures and the ventilation are different in different regions. So you could take an alveolus that looks exactly the same. If it's in the upper lobe, it's going to have less blood in it. If it's in the lower lobe, it's going to have more blood in it and multiple others. So there's a com it's, it's really a real complexity problem. And this is, look at this, this is sort of normal lung. And you can see that it's relatively variable. The other thing I wanted to show, this is actually different diseases. So this is a CT scan. This is a normal person. That's the way it looks, beautiful. Dark means air. And this is different lung diseases. And every one of them has a different thing. And the, one I want, the reason I'm showing it, many of these lungs have actually normal areas. And most of the normal lung tissues you have read about in the world came from this. Normal histology lungs from people with cancer. This is the easiest sample to get. So when we speak about normal, we really need to know what is it. Is it normal structurally? Is it normal immunologically? Is it normal environmentally? So that we have a, I, I, what I call 
a, comp a real complexity problem. And this is sort of an example from my favorite lung disease, pulmonary fibrosis. So basically, in the same biopsy, within a few microns from each other, you have something that looks completely normal and something that looks completely sick. And what we would like to know, and that's why we're doing single cell analysis, is what is the difference? So what makes these guys be so beautiful, whereas these guys are so ugly? The only thing is the resolution of how we do single cell analysis today. We still actually are doing bulk lung because we're taking both of these things together. And this is another example. If you do micro CT, which is allows you to measure um, image the lung at five to 10 microns of resolution. So this actually looks like pathology. Sorry. Oh. Um, you can see that within the lung, you will see this. This is this beautiful regions. They're healthy. This have a little bit of disease. This have more. And this is sort of end stage. This is, again, within the same lung. Now, what is interesting, we actually find this also in what we call normal histology lungs. So for instance, we, we, we get uh, um, lungs that were rejected for transplant, a lung biopsy from a healthy patient, who, an older patient with cancer. You will find this. And you'll find many other sources of noise. And you know, our group has been actually very good at getting sort of bulk analysis, and we were able to identify um, differential expression of genes that are in early disease and late disease and all. I, you know, I'm not going to go well into this, but I just want to mention, again, that there's a lot of, um, I hate to say it, the brain is sort of very active intellectually, but the truth is that no you know, very few inflammatory cells can in, come into it when you're healthy. You know, it doesn't change. It's not exposed to environmental injuries all the time. So the ambition, and that's what I want us to discuss, is actually how we address it, is the ambition is to characterize the normal human lung cell atlas. But there's a slight chance that no matter what we do, unless we look at data from multiple sources, we won't be able to come to really do these ideal, pristine, healthy cells. So what we need to focus, from my point of view, on the diversity and the spatial distribution of these diverse uh, cell populations. So I'll actually stop here and ask people, what do you think? So did I just convince you that we shouldn't do the human lung cell atlas? <laughs> Or how do we actually address this diversity, this complexity? You did make me think of one thing, because as we're showing all of this data, I think one thing that we forget is actually just regular old histology has huge amounts of information in it. Um, and I think, you know, in addition to doing all this multiplex ISH and antibody staining, we should be comparing that directly with some of our best conventional morphologic techniques. Whether that's, you know, EM, you know, on, on sections of tissue or just H&E staining, we should consider that because many of these diseases are defined based on some kind of pathologic criterion, and there's an enormous amount of signal uh, in terms of just pure morphology. In those. So, so, so I'll, just to mention this, is actually one of our biggest efforts now is what we're doing is we're taking these small lung voxels, we do micro CT on them, so now we have a three-dimensional representation of the tissue, and then we're trying to implement nuclear seq. And then what happens is that micro CT basically warms up the tissue and you have a lot of degradation. So we put in a lot of work. I think we have a method. But that's exactly the kind of things we need to think about. How do we represent the lung in a more yeah, three-dimensional and complex way? Yeah, go ahead. So I, I just wanted to um, agree with what Jay said and bring it back to what Dana said earlier about um, other image data as well. But your question reminds me of GTEx. So um, I was part of the GTEx project, and we have um, 
I think, lungs from, you know, close to 900 donors. Um, and we had every, uh, every piece we sampled had an H&E slide made and was reviewed by a team of three pathologists. And if you go through the pathology comments, which I've done, there's almost nothing that actually says normal, healthy. Right. Everyone says this region of cells look good, there's this, there's that, the other. Um, and one of the things, uh, you know, and others in the room can comment on it who've analyzed the data as well, I think is key, and it came up earlier today, is really it's documenting, doc maybe it came up here, is documenting as much of that as you can to be able to include in the analyses. Um, and, you know, the sort of standard for GTEx, even though our goal was to collect normal, was that normal is normal for that stage of life. And in the case you've shown, normal includes some damage, probably some whatever it is. But as long as there's nothing vastly abnormal, we're not trying to study a, humor, a tumor here, so we would exclude that. But you know, normal is, this is what normal is. So um, it's key that there's no one standard normal like no one reference, but we need to sample enough to define that normal variation. Um, and I think it's really key to get a lot of the histology along with it and, some, and then combined with some of the spatial analyses. Um, but documenting all of that as much as possible exactly. is really uh, key to having the analyses you do. This might be a technical question, but how much imaging can we do on a sample? Like how big a chunk can you get before you start subjecting it to the various forms of spatial transcriptomics? Like how much detail can we get, morphologic detail, and then subject that same tissue to any one of the spatial methods? Is it just a section, a 10 micron section, or can we do better than that? So, so in, in one of the projects we were involved in, actually, we developed this morphometric approach of lung sampling, um, which basically, again, we worked on voxel, so for one centimeter by centimeter, because this is the one thing you could easily bring back to the CT scan of the whole lung, so you actually say where it is. And then we would basically take the upper slide, the lower slide, and the middle slide as a sort of a random approach. But again, I think there's, there's a lot of um, failure. Um, there's a lot of um, um, groundwork that needs to be laid to think about this. There's a, not to make it more complicated, but the, um, but you know, Avi Spira's work at BU, he's actually shown that if you have a lung cancer, a tiny little nodule out in the distal lung, like yeah. um, what Naftali was showing you, that if you go as far away as the airway or even the nasal epithelium, you have transcriptional changes that are, con that are driven by the presence of that nodule. And the same thing with many of these other lung diseases. So, you know, even if you're in that, what looks like normal histology, right? you may actually have uh, changes related to that pathology that's somewhat distant. But, um, so after, uh, you know, we told them it's probably impossible to do it, this is an example of some of the data we generated recently, and this is uh, um, 53 human lungs. We already have more, which have been diced, um, um, made into lung soups, and basically all uh, cells went into RNA-seq. And the reason I want to show this to you, actually, if you actually bother to read it, you'll see there's many known lung cells, but there's also many things that we annotated as um, apoptotic assorted, right? <laughs> 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 because and this is basically what we call our favorite uh, method of uh, classifying cells now, which is uh, um, uh, TEB, which is uh, Taylor eyeballing method. So basically, Taylor, the student that does it, looks at the list and say, oh, this looks like this and this. Interestingly, we've actually validated it you know, now on three independent observers, and it actually works perfectly well. So I classify the cells very similar to what he does. And I wonder if we could actually apply some learning met methods beyond this to this sort of putting in this expert type of method. Now, of course, this aims that identify separate cells, and many of these cells can represent uh, um, um, substitu uh, you know, s subclasses or subtypes or different differentiation. That's, that's another thing. That's actually the example, sort of the good examples. We can actually classify cell-specific cell signals and disease. And if we look to the gene list here, 
really meaningful. Actually, those molecules I discovered in my career 20 years ago that are being developed for therapy now that are in this data. So the, the data is actually meaningful despite of the noise. But I, I just want to mention one more thing. The one is just because it's a really nice unicorn or phoenix. I don't know what we call this figure. But this is analysis of a subcell type using basically archetype analysis. And these are uh, mesenchymal cells in, the, in pulmonary fibrosis, uh, uh, controls, and COPD. And basically, there's two big groups of cells that we see we call fibroblasts and fibroblasts. They behave as we would expect them. Now, if we project the disease on them, you will see that actually there is a strong core of what you can call normal fibroblasts in all three diseases. So control is blue, um, yellow is COPD, and red is IPF. And you can see this group sort of, what is it, the tail of the unicorn is actually relatively homogeneous. And I think it could allow us to define what is normal if we actually include some disease tissue. And then we get these bunch of things. So there's a sort of what we may think is COPD specific and this whole big thing which are, is the IPF cells. And now we can throw in actually the individuals and look at it and you can start seeing that actually many individuals are, uh, uh, are really, the contribution of all of them is very similar. But as you said, there may be one individual that sort of has a bigger contribution. And you know, this may be important, this may be not. Um, we are actually <laughs> thinking about what we do with it because the last thing you wanna do is show something that's wrong. The other thing you don't wanna do is not report something that somebody else who's smarter than you could make sense of. And uh, the last thing I wanted to show is actually when we look at some markers, we suddenly discover, and this is the continuity effect, that in this, the horn of the unicorn actually contains an extremely rare cell population. And we started looking at it, and it's every patient with IPF has five cells, maybe 10. So we're speaking 23 patients. We profile, I don't know how many, uh, 250,000 cells overall. I don't remember the number of them, the fibromas. That's a rare population that's probably meaningful, right? And the question again is how we, we deal with the question, is this just an extreme phenotype, just an archetype uh, a, a phenotype or that was developed because it's a new cell population or because it's just a, you know, this is the cell, the post-traumatic stress disorder cell that suffered so much in the sick lung. But I think that these kind of analysis really help us to start distinguishing between the um, individual defined variants and actually the common elements, even in really, really rare uh, elements. So in general, I, would, I, you know, I wanted to be optimistic. I do want to want, highlight the difficulties because that, they're going to feed in our discussion. And again, in the lung, one of the biggest difficulties is source of tissue. Healthy donor, very limited, mostly airways, very hard to get lung parenchyma from uh, healthy donors who are completely healthy. Biopsy, usually they have a disease. So even if you go to the norm, most normal area in this disease, but there's some disease effect. Um, cadaver. Again, uh, to get normal lungs, you can get, get normal lungs from uh, transplant rejects, from rapid autopsy. Every one of them will have something. You know, I've never seen a lung that's been ventilated doesn't have a little bit dirt in it. There's also, and we tend to sort of forget about it. We actually have identified, and our groups have identified some genes that are predisposed to chronic lung disease, like the MAC5V phenotype is strongly associated with pulmonary fibrosis. But it's also an extremely common genetic variant. So there's a good chance, again, that you're profiling somebody healthy now, but they're, they're gonna develop a disease. And I would argue that we probably need to genotype the individuals that we're uh, studying, at least for the common known disease. Of course, demographic, race, gender, age. Age changes. Uh, 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 the lung phenotype, the definition of what is normal, the question of exposure, the diseases and comorbidities. Um, actually, very few 50-year-old uh, people who we get their lungs actually are not on drugs. So they're getting medications, and most of these medications have an effect. Um, the question of cells, so basically uh, resident versus um, whatever we call it, infiltrating or mi migrant, 
The proximity, this is an important thing, that the behavior of cells in the lung is affected by who is their neighbor. So type 1 epithelial cells are usually close to endothelial cells. Type 2 cells are actually closer to the interstitial macrophages. These are things that we tend to not to think about. We'll have to do these tissue validations, but also our analytics, it's almost data collection. data collection, but also potentially um, developing a method that our uh, computational approaches provide us some priors for thinking about this. Um, of course, the sort of the progenitor niches, and there's, I think, what, one of the things we're going to discover, there's many more progenitor niches in the lung than we thought. Many, many of these places, like the junctions, they're usually, there's some weird cells there. Um, technological biopsies, um, uh, as we discussed, the only way I can think we can handle this is basically describing and doing multiple technologies handling the same thing. Uh, rare cell populations, standard. This came, the question about spiking cells. So this was discussed before I actually planned to have the discussion now, should we spike in something? I do think that having a um, um, clean, um, centrally organized data set of bulk profiles or so of sorted lung cells will help us, right? Uh, calibrating data, computing results, and other things. And that could be a clearly cell atlas effort, right? It makes sense. You disperse lungs and you basically sort and you do these profiles and it becomes a source for everybody. Um, the question of you know, phenotypes of cells, continuous versus binary. And then the other, th the last thing, again, in the tissue, the lung is a complex organ. There's multiple compartments, the airways, the vasculature, the alveolar, both from the side of the air and the side of the, I'm specifically saying not basal or apical, but air and blood containing. All of these things need to characterize Thinking about the functional module, so is the cell you're looking at at the basis of the lung or at the apices because their behavior may be different. Um, so all of these things, again, are, are critically important if we really prov provide an atlas. Now, how would we actually do a human cell atlas? So Dana, you want to lead this, or? Yeah, because I have the answers. <laughs> I know. So I actually am going to, after we had a lot of slides, uh, I'm going to switch to slide-free mode. I did prepare a few, but I think uh, I want to get as much talking as possible. So we just heard three phenomenal interactive presentations, let's call them, from three phenomenal experts in the field. And I want to state and declare as firmly as possible that I'm not an expert in the field. I just find lungs fascinating. And um, we can all go home now, and these three people will continue doing their own amazing thing and continue to publish amazing papers. But the whole goal of this consortium was to do something that's bigger than the sum of the parts. So what can we do now so that you know, next week these three amazing people won't go home each their separate ways and continue to do great science, but what can the human cell atlas do together that will lead so that their work and other work and of people in the audience and people that are listening on video that couldn't be here or anyone who wants to join this effort uh, do so that we can build something bigger because, you know, We've just heard how complex this thing can be, far more than the efforts of even the best funded and most brilliant lab can do. But if we could start small. How, how would you merge these three stories that we just heard into something bigger? So again, there's the big thing, doing everything, understanding everything, knowing every cell, how it works, what it does, what its context, how it interacts with its neighbors, how it develops, and how it would respond to any insult uh, uh, in the planet, or in outer space once we go there, after this planet is destroyed uh, by uh, climate change. Um, <laughs> what, what do we do we'll to actually create a community that's bigger than the sum of the parts? Um, so, uh, Dana, thank you so much. Um, thank you, and I hope that we will um, 
stay away from this post ending. But um, can we actually learn something from other atlases that are actually a little bit less complex and that were proven to be successful? And what are the technical benchmarks and maybe statistical benchmarks that we can actually learn from those simple atlases? There are other tissues that are less complex. Are we aware of any examples so like this? So actually, most of the atlases are starting together. So it's not like there's lots of simple atlases out there and things that have been done and that we can just you know, learn from them. Uh, I think that some organs might be insulted if you call them simple, so I'm not going to call names. Uh, but I'll tell you that the only atlas, what? The simple brain. Yeah, what I was about to say is the only atlas that actually has a head start on the other atlases and the only atlas that got funded, started in the consortium and got going is the simplest, easiest organ of them all, the brain. And uh, we brought you the brain uh, in the plenary because they sort of said this is lessons that we learned and, and that was in the plenary and planned as that. So yes, the brain is the only one where we have some experience. And the experience of the brain, the first most important thing was the coordinate system. Because as you collect samples, so you know that Jane and Tali will know that they're talking about the same thing. And if you take a sample and you try and compare cells, are they different because this is a disease cell and this is a healthy cell? Are they different because they are different distances from each other? And, and there, there is context. There is context where you are in the airway. There is context. Uh, you know, who you are, and there's context even how far or, or, or near you are to an endothelial cell. And, and the better that we can collect samples in a way that can record, for example, even image where it came from, preserve your samples so that you can later use imaging technologies that aren't there. You know, how can we begin collecting our data in a way that we can begin having a language of it, image it, one of our ideas is there's a lot of language and a lot of things that you guys know, and there's a lot of things we don't know. So if we image, preserve, preserve tissue, because the nice thing is many of the tissue things can work with preserved tissues, then use all sorts of, let's call it the buzzword machine learning to figure out new structures that we should have labeled. If we collect, if we image, if we preserve, we can even go back and give more value to these samples. But how, how do we make a plan so that tomorrow morning we can set out to, you know, surpass the brain in, 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 our, in our maturity? Because you want to beat them, even though they had a head start. And I'm actually asking you guys. Hi, I'm, I'm Jeremy Miller. I actually work on the brain, so I'll give you something from the other perspective. Um, I, I didn't mean to insult you. No, no, I know. So, so things that, that I found useful are, one is computationally um, strategies for matching data that comes from two different sources. So if you want to directly compare the, the data that you get from your two atlases, um, you know, you can see whether they, you know, whether the clusters you get from one or the spaces line up. Um, the second is, as you were just saying, coming up with, with collecting metadata that's really useful so that you can see whether the things you match up actually should be the same thing or not. And then a third thing that I think is probably further down the line is um, genetic tools to enrich for rare populations. So th th those are things that we find useful in brain at least. I mean, you know, I can address some of those things. So in terms of similarity, the AWG has actually, and, and different people in the community are developing methods to actually compare and, and metrics to actually compare two samples are getting better and better. Uh, the problem is that most of this stuff is being done by clueless computational people that don't know the biology, and I actually want to go to a very basic question of what is a good similarity metric. Because not all things weigh equal, and some differences matter more than others. And right now our similarity metrics is, are, uh, metrics are, are very, you know, we could be looking at cells or we could be looking at stocks. Is there things that the biological community could say, these things matter more and these things matter less when you build similarity metrics to compare between samples? That will improve the quality of, of the metrics and the atlas. That was, again, I'm the clueless computational person. 
there are for sure parameters like prevalence, heterogeneity, and co-expression of genes that can be considered and evaluated in a very simple and quantitative way. So I don't think we can say endothelial cells or inflammatory cells or fibroblasts are more important, but finding some parameters, uh, like I'm, as I'm saying, uh, prevalence of si uh, types of cells, co-expression of genes should give us uh, a guide. So, so again, you, th those, those are statistical methods, gene uh, co-expression, covariance, all, um, you know, differences, we, we can do that all the time. One of the things that, that we've noticed, for example, you know, the ribosomal genes, they're the most dominant thing in the world. Perhaps, you know, there's lots of biology that we don't understand, but we often get more meaningful biological questions when, when we enrich for genes that have something to do with the biology that we're remotely interested in. Of course, you don't want it too targeted. You know, the, the, the trick is to find the right balance. You don't want it too targeted on the 20 genes that the field's been studying for 20 years, but you don't want, you know, differences in ribosomes and other things to, to determine everything you say about these systems. So it's finding that balance and finding the processes and that, that are more important for the lung. What? Where? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, Asaf from Dana-Farber. So uh, you can uh, definitely imagine that uh, we are focusing on uh, tumors, but that can uh, um, also help, I guess, your question, Dana. Uh, so actually, two remarks. One is uh, for action items from this meeting, uh, we can think about one problem or one issue such as uh, ischemia time or, or the way that we sampled the, uh, our specimen and then go across all the studies and compare between them. And to that extent, I'll move to my second remark. So we are part of the uh, tumor cell atlas and we have lung samples that we sample not only from Denofar but also from MGH. And we um, actually improve the communication between the hospitals and within the hospitals, within the um, CRCs, uh, the clinical research coordinators, pathologists, and the labs. So now we can document and have a very rich database of um, uh, metadata. And we have uh, images that we can actually focus on where the tumor is. That's what's interesting uh, for us. And uh, between 50 million cells, we can focus on those 10,000 cells that we would like to sequence, uh, and so on and so forth. So uh, what I would like to suggest is uh, to enrich the metadata database that uh, we can have in, this, uh, in, in these collections, uh, and that to create more uh, integrated data after we have the sequences and the spatial. Spatial is another aspect in uh, the tumor cell atlas, uh, so we allocate tissue for spatial analysis, uh, spatial analysis in all the, the uh, possible four or five uh, essays that uh, we have so far. Uh, and to the question how much uh, biomaterial we need, actually we need two biopsies for that, so two core needle biopsies uh, that we allocate for that. I would suggest not only sharing the metadata, but also trying to sort of converge as a community what are, what are the best uh, protocols and standard operating procedures, because minor differences in the protocol makes major differences in final data. And I would rather, you know, focus uh, the normalization and the comparison on, on the biology rather than you guys did 10x, you guys did end drops, in drops, you guys did fluidime, you guys, you know, waited 20 minutes uh, till you handled the sample, you guys used this enzyme and you guys used that enzyme, and at the end of the day, that's, you know, different, more different than a disease than normal almost. Uh, well, but, but I mean, going back to your point that these three guys go out differently than they walked in, right? I mean, um, I mean if this last slide, right, you had all these... Go to transform the three of you, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you had all these parameters that we're worried about, or you, you might be worried about, um, and I guess what one 
then would need to do practically is to pick out a few that are realistically addressable and then and then kind of discuss here which are the ones that you are worried about. Is it the technical variation between the way you dissociate your cells? Um, is it kind of 10x versus smart C2 what people do? Is it, I mean, is it interlap variability in general? Would there be a standard source? I mean, maybe even a mouse, right? Everyone of you could take a black six mouse and, and go through your procedures and that would be a standardized material that might work better or can you free cells and send it around? I mean, if you could pick three parameters that you were at most and maybe make an experimental design to get us an idea of the effect of magnitude that might be a step better that will not solve all problems, but maybe that's a doable step. I, I'm saying much the same thing, but pragmatically, what can we do? I, I, I think, you know, if there is a cons if there's a consensus and sort of the data wranglers have got a form that the HCA is saying these are the ways that we these are the metadata that we're looking for, right? And those could be the location, which actually the cancer people have figured out good ways to actually identify precisely where things are. And, and Martin alluded to him in his first slide, you know, um, they're you know height of the patient will tell you lung size. Um, uh, uh, and then there should be like a checklist. Do you have imaging data that's associated with this? Do you have pa stored pathologic samples? Not so much as that you're mandating that to be part of the, the, the project, but to, so people can actually say, these are the things that I should be thinking about as I consent the patients, as I collect the data. Because whatever we do now, right, five years from now will be obsolete and we'll be going back. And for the data to be still alive, it needs to be you be uh, applied to the archival tissue. Uh, I like this idea and uh, of that this would be an amazing outcome from my point of view if we say, okay, we actually need to identify what sources of problems we actually don't have to deal with now. Right? They will fix themselves with validation, with replication, with others. Whereas what are the key issues that if we don't solve them early, we are basically dooming our efforts in the next five years. So identify three or four sources uh, and then developing a common approach would be good. Um, I'm wondering whether to get the human cell atlas, we need to go away from the human. So basically do the pig lung atlas or the horse lung atlas or any other animal that's large enough and relatively similar that we could actually sacrifice when they're healthy and use them as our reference, right, in some ways, or again, as an approximate reference. And then the disease sample, the intervened samples, everything we do. So Imagine that you take, you take three big lungs, inflate them, cut them morphometrically, do a high-resolution CT, then do single cell. You know where you got everything. It's not going to be a perfect representation of the human. I'm suspecting it's going to be a better representation of the human than some of the stuff we do. I, I, I actually do like controlled systems uh, a lot. I think... I think it's very important to look at controlled systems, um, you know, to build something systematic and then... Just do the mouse. What? Okay. Mice are too small. Um, even though... Yeah. Another question I, I could ask is, you know, the, the Human Cell Atlas is a consortium. It has actually its domain experts are, are, are a minority. There's uh, a very large computational community. There's a very large... Uh, technological community uh, that that are that are uh, there's a very large software engineering uh, and, and DCP community. So, what are things you think that are generalized that that the HCA community, not lung experts, can do to help facilitate um, the lung atlas? What things would help you? What things would make you want to engage more in working together and uh, rather than going and continuing to do your own thing? What things are missing? Hey Dana, yeah, I, I think on this one, um, uh, you know, if you if you challenge us, like how can the three of us 
actually, you know, move the f field forwards by, by, you know, teaming up or anything. Uh, the first thing is, you know, uh, what I would really like is I have my data. Uh, we have Dropseek data. Uh, we have Jay's data. Uh, we have Naftali's data. So, you know, this, this whole bucket of data, they're all from different platforms and different labs and different, you know, what. A, how, how do we merge them in a meaningful way that we can actually understand and compare my cells to those from his data set and his data set? Because at this moment, that's very hard to do. And this is something that, you know, I'm, I'm a long person, not a computational person. How, how could we, you know, could, what could the Human Cell Atlas computational group help us here? So we are thinking of ways to merge, uh, and there's actually probably the biggest computational efforts in aligning data sets uh, from different labs and different technologies. Um, and there has been made progress on it. But one thing is for sure, it's a, it's a hard problem. That's why we, we don't have it delivered yet. But actually, if you, the, the first three days in this auditorium, Monday through Wednesday, we actually saw some real improvement in, in aligning data sets. On the other hand, it's very clear that each alignment normalizes making assumptions are focused on one question and not another, and loses a lot of information in the data. So, you know, we can work hard to align the data sets. There are solutions that are better than we were, where we were a half a year ago, but we're not magicians. Any type of normalization that tries to make up for lack of good design, a lack of coherence when you collect the data, is going to be at non-trivial cost of loss of signal and loss of information and data. So yes, we could try and merge your old data sets, but it would be much more effective, both in terms of our time and in terms of the value of the atlas and information. I mean, this atlas is going to cost lots of money to collect. You each are running on big grants. If the human cell atlas gets you know, funded by other sources, you know, $10 million for a pilot, I mean, this is big money. So we might as well design this to get as much as information rather than assume Let's you know, do our thing, each group, and then fix it through normalization. Normalization will be able to help. These methods will get better, but they come at a real cost. I think what, one answer to your question oh, is, yeah, I mean, oh yeah, so you know, we use like uh, lung transplant donors that get transplanted and don't get transplanted. And the reason for that is we, that was as close to normal as we could possibly get. But I think the thing that maybe we're missing from the lung community is that you know, there's so much richness in terms of the clinical metadata that most of our studies don't harvest it at all. And I think if we just think about a, a normal cell atlas without thinking about disease going in a forward fashion, we lose a, a, a lot of power. And speaking to kind of tying together a few threads, like you were asking what to focus on, maybe some bulk sequencing in sick patients uh, is something to collect so that we could, you know, pare down which genes from a particular data set we may want to be interested in. Why and, bulk? Well, just, well, we, I mean, we could do everything all at once, and it would be fascinating, as Naftali said, to go ahead and get, you know, IPF lungs and do single cell sequencing on everything. But, but, <laughs> but <laughs> Naftali's been there, done that. <laughs> and the other thing with clinical metadata is it's very possible, although we all like single cells, there are certain physiologic parameters that probably are not operant at the single cell level. Uh, or, you know, even if you're thinking about cell migration, there are cable properties of epithelial tissues that are more important than what specific cell type you have there. And I think if we ignore that, if we make single cells like the, the scale in which we'll consider tissues or disease, we'll do ourselves a disservice. I, I totally agree. I mean, that's why we're having separate uh, breakouts to say, Okay, we're trying to move from clouds uh, to atlases. It's very clear we need structure. It's very clear we need the spatial methods at multiple resolution, both histology and, and bigger uh, coordinate frameworks and, and organs. But what additional things do we need in your community to make it um, functional? I mean, we saw on the brain, they had these electrical recordings and uh, all these other things. And yes, it would be very good to dis define what are the things that are going to make the lung atlas valuable and interpretable in terms of lung function and, and things? The, the one other thing I'd like to raise, which you know, wasn't raised, I actually expected you to raise it, is you know, uh, looking at the regenerative capacity. How, how do we understand wound healing and, and regeneration, which is something that constantly happens? And, and how are we going to get a good map of, of these wound healing regeneration properties that I think reflect 
in, in every lung. I mean, you guys, each of you said this thing gets, you know, injured and insulted all through the life. And what we see are the processes of wound healing and regeneration, even in the healthiest of lung. That might be How are we going to understand these processes? How are we going to collect data so that we can interpret what we see in these imperfect healthy normal lungs in the context of past injuries. But that, that might be one advantage the lung has. I'd, I'd like to hear what, since we're constantly assaulted by environmental pathogens and toxins, we'll actually, I think, be able to sample lung and find a lot of quote unquote pathologic cells. And then when we go back in spatial transcriptomics, we might find these regions. And it's not like we're operating in a void. I mean, pathologists have defined squamous metaplasia and mucous metaplasia. So we have some indices to do that. And I think spatial transcriptomics will let us map back. Because I think we might as well allow natural injury itself to be. I mean, this is an advantage that we really have uh, over but, maybe. But if you see the, the course of like a lung that's been injured and healed, will you have enough information or again, if we're talking about these in vitro and other and or, or, or mouse models, do we need to collect, you know, dynamic temporal models of injury and recovery so that we'd be able to interpret, you know, the recovered damaged tissue that we see? But Dana, um, Dana, I'm sorry. Isn't it actually what you were asking about when you were talking about the landscapes? Isn't it the part of the normal? And that's just the reality where we have to be in. Like, we're not the lab mice that we'll have in those defined spaces where we, hey, you arrived at your destination of seriated cells, congratulations. Like, we will be living in no, this. No, I, I believe And that that's the part of the developmental atlas and aging atlas that will also fit in. We can't be without the injury. No, no, I, I, I agree that this is what we, we, we need to include in our atlas and in what we consider the human lung normal atlas. But the question is, what type of additional data, rather than passively looking at these lungs, do we need to collect, both in terms of some of these physiological assays of, you know, the physiological behaviors of some of these cells that you don't see from single cell RNA-seq, as well as some of the histories of how they got there. I'm just asking what non, you know, passive profiling of, you know, individuals do we need to actually interpret the, at the, the atlas? What special, what special data and additional things can we collect that's not single cell RNA-seq or spatial transcriptomics of static you know, sample can we collect to better interpret what we're looking at? Now, I have to say, just from the history of genetics, if you had a list of all the genes and their chromosomal locations, you would know nothing. Right. I mean, essentially, you needed mutants to give you a phenoty phenotype. And then that's what disease is here, really, for us. So the more, as we have this conversation, I think at some point relatively soon, we'll have to get single cell sequencing of well kind of characterized disease sets. It's in our mandate and to define right here and now we want to include disease in the uh, human lung atlas because it's a must have and, and disease for the lung is included and we can declare that right here and now. So, so Rather I would, than trying to separate them arbitrarily in a way that seems to be inappropriate for this organ. So, uh, that, so, so yeah. if, if you think about what Naftali said, mm, Basically, sampling enough uh, individuals would, uh, you talked about the phenotypic landscape of all the different states cells can be in. So, uh, like as a thought experiment, how many individuals do we have to sample to, to get through all these uh, different possible states? And uh, so we could use the mouse models to, to, to kind of direct this and better understand the boundaries. Uh, I mean, not to say that mouse and human will be the same, but uh, uh, so like, we could think the, the initial sampling phase, like uh, doing hundreds of different individuals, even if we wouldn't have any information, metadata information about these patients, we would get that manifold, and we, we, we could define the, the most prominent states and go back to spatial transcriptomics and, and see whether that really exists. And uh, so maybe it's not that important to worry too much initially about the experimental design, but rather get a lot of data. So that was some impression I got so from this discussion. I'm willing to go with that model under one condition. We do worry we about experimental design of common SOPs and, 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 and protocols. But if, if we're voting, I would vote to include disease. <laughs> I need to.
um, from the um, from the online comment stream that touch on this. One of them is um, someone commented, you could almost ignore whether the lungs are, are normal or not, just collect a ton of metadata for each sample used, and then ask the data what states are present when. Um, and also a, a, another question on what we're including and not, uh, someone was curious about the developmental cell atlas on lung and if there are any status updates on that and whether that falls under your purview under development cell atlas. Um, I mean, uh, the develop, there, there's a separate group for development that's gonna try and collate, but actually the developing lung is under the, you know, our purview, so. I, we're, uh, yeah, I can give a brief update on the sort of efforts in profiling. So lung map is an effort to profile systematically um, the developing lung. There's actually a lot of data. Unfortunately, not all of it is shared yet. Uh, and I wish that there were way more aggressive regulations about sharing data before publications in these collaborative projects. Hopefully, we are better than that. But there's really cool data there on both laser capture micro dissection of different regions, single cells, bulk cells. So this is happening. Uh, in the, mostly in the mouse, but a little bit in the human. They're running into the same issues of sampling in the human. I would say I would be completely for profiling a lot of lungs, right? In the, in the end, if we come up with one protocol of, uh, or one or two protocol, and a minimal set of data that allows us to analyze the thing, the power is going to be in the numbers. The only thing I would say is we would still need to make sure that we think about the spatial aspect of the sampling. So for instance, you could go out, you could collect 100 transplanted, uh, transplant rejects. They're gonna be different versions of sick normal. Uh, as long as you make sure that you sampled in a very systematic way, the airways, the alveoli, and everything, there's a good chance we'll, be, we'll have a good answer. Maybe we need, as, as I said, a few normal animal lungs to calibrate it. Uh, but I think this is exactly where, as you said, the SOPs ha are critical because if you're going to collect these lungs and every center does it slightly different, you know, impossible to interpret. We have about, you know, two more comments and then we're wrapping up. So if we are getting a, a sample from tumor resection and we know the bronchopulmonary segment, would you think that's good enough. Like if many, many labs around the world do the same, uh, randomly we go through hundreds of uh, these samples. Um, you think that's good enough in getting, let's say, some, some good coverage of, of the whole entire lung? That, or, uh, that's only good enough to discover, <laughs> to describe uh, the single cell transcriptome of lungs with cancer. I mean, I think we have to do that. Yeah, whatever, yeah. Yeah, the, uh, the, the, the non-affected uh, no, region, right? No, but I'm saying, right? if, yeah. if you're getting the lung from one source, that's what you're gonna, that's gonna be part of the problem. Yeah, I'm not saying that this is the, the sole source we should use, but just as an example, like, yeah. uh, I guess we should discuss the different types of sources and which ones should be included. I mean, you, I think you mentioned that this is the most common source of yeah, that's getting. So we get the donor lungs sometimes, but uh, so basically from tumor resection, we can have every week or, or two a week. And so that, that, from the pragmatic side, so uh, I that there's limitations too, right? I suggest doing that in a data-driven fashion. So let's do a couple sort of donors from like, you know, these tra transplant rejects, rejects or things like that, so that we have more systematic picture of them. Once we know something that is, you know, to the best degree that we have, what that looks like, and maybe a couple other scenarios if there are specific things that are bad with these transplant lungs, um, then we can look at the tumors and we can say how much are these adjacent tissues relevant to the normals? How, how different are they than to the other ones? If we see that these adjacent t tissues actually really look good and look normal, let's go out to town. If we see that the tumor is really influencing them and there is some signature that we really see now that we have enough data to identify it that's sort of very tumor specific, we'll be more careful. But I think we, we don't have the data to answer that. I'd also say with regard to lung cancer, it's probably the most deeply studied lung disease already. Uh, and many of the, uh, even though it's the easiest tissue to get, perhaps in part because it is the easiest tissue to get, that there's so much more information on that than any other lung disease. So I think we should focus on 
uh, things that, you know, are, that have been completely understudied that may have, you know, very clear pathologic definitions. To this regard, if we're going to go after uh, human disease, I think we should incorporate, like, wide swaths of groups who can do bronchial biopsies or transbronchial biopsies and figure out how their data could get processed. Um, in some, like how could, and you know, there are groups with great patient kindreds all, all over the world. And I think they'll be highly informative. And if we make it easy for them to plug in, yeah. uh, that And that give them very huge. standardized protocols. Exactly, yeah. But I would say one thing also about the standardized operating procedure that many people have mentioned. We don't know what it should be yet. No, we need to work uh, to figure it out yeah, we, and share it. And it may that's, not be, that's work. But it may not be that simple, right? So I'll take just, for example, the trachea. Like even if you feel your neck, you feel this hard cartilage. And, you know, and there's smooth muscle that's constricting around. No one procedure is going to dissociate. No, I'm not saying there's tissues. one procedure that is going to be suitable for the entire lung, top to dot, bottom, and every piece of it. But if we're going for the trachea or for any piece, you know, where we can be standardized, let's be yeah. standardized. So I think we need to wrap up. And I, I want to uh, particularly thank, you know, all of you for participating and giving your uh, ideas and um, you know, if on on behalf of the Human Cell Atlas, I'm I'm ex incredibly happy that we managed to bring you know three of the world's biggest experts on lungs to spend their time with us. So let's uh, thank our uh, domain experts uh, and give them a round of applause.